This is Radio 314 on the Red Ice Radio Network. Welcome back. This is Lana, and with all the programs available to listen to, thanks for choosing this one. This interview was conducted in a different format than usual. Although it features two guests, they were both recorded at different times. First, we hear from Gregory Smith. Later, John Rappaport gives a brief 20-minute commentary. We'll be discussing topics from American Addict, a film co-written and produced by Gregory Smith. John Rappaport is an associate producer. The film American Addict unveils how America has gone from the land of the free to the land of the addicted. But of course, we'll discuss much more than addiction. Welcome, Greg. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. appreciate it. Since you're new to the program and you have quite a resume, fill in the audience on your background and what you do. Well, I am a medical doctor and um, I'm board certified both in anesthesia and pain management. And for the last uh, eight to 10 years, I've been really focused on uh, addiction medicine in reference to chronic pain management, really because I noticed that most of the patients were getting addicted on prescription narcotics. So I was very conventionally trained at Washington University in St. Louis, which is one of the top three or four medical schools. But again, I had to sort of unlearn what I had learned conventionally and really start looking into alternative and complementary medicine, nutrition. Uh, And this is how I sort of evolved and started a program called the NESP, that's NESP, NESP program in 2005, which is a very unique way and permanent way to really treat people with addictions to prescription pills by using a combination of DNA testing uh, along with balancing brain chemistry. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, that also led me to make uh, the movie American Addict um, because I really wanted to show people how this is on purpose. There's, there is, it is uh, not happenstance that 70% of Americans are taking at least one prescription medication a day. Uh, sick people are big business and great business, and I'm just trying to turn that around because it's not not uh, morally a good thing. Yeah, last night I watched the film American Addict on Netflix. Well done, by the way. Uh, the film was listed in the most popular category for documentary films on Netflix. Does this mean the world is finally ready to look at their codependency of pills? Well, you know, I'm glad to hear that. I didn't know that it was doing that well. I know I'm getting a lot of response, uh, Twitter and uh Facebook notifications from the Netflix release. But but yeah, I think people are thirsting for the truth. I think there's an awakening going on in general in this country uh, for all the things that's being done to us instead of for us. And American Attic is just uh, one of those things that's shining a light on how we're being forced to be basically on medication or a medicated society and a society that's medicated, a society that's distracted. Uh, you can do pretty much anything out in the open and in secret at the same time. And I think that's part of the issue here is that people are just over-medicated for problems that could be solved if we looked at a solution or a cure instead of a Band-Aid to the problem, which is a pill for a problem. Yeah, and the film you mentioned how the U.S. is 5% of the world's population but consumes over 50% of the world's pharmaceuticals and 80% of the narcotics. I mean, that is insane. It is, it is, it's, a, it's a tremendous, it's a mind-blowing statistic. And again, this is on purpose. This is a deliberate act. And so people have to educate themselves so they don't become American addicts themselves. When you say deliberate act, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is that it's, when, you, when you look at those numbers, they are so out of proportion. There is no way that this could just be happening by circumstance or happenstance. So in other words, there has been a deliberate push in this country to push medicine towards pharmaceutical-based treatments versus natural treatments versus alternative treatments and also a push to have doctors spend much less time with patients. So, you know, today versus, say, 20 years ago, the average time a patient has with a doctor has shrank dramatically. In fact, that's if you see a doctor at all. Often you're being seen by a physician's assistant or another type of assistant. And because of shrinking reimbursements to doctors, they have to see more and more patients in less and less time just to make the similar money that they made 10, 15 years ago. So that means that if a person comes in and has a problem, you don't have time to sit there and really get to the bottom of it. All you have time to do is to write a prescription 
for a pill and then they come back every 30 days. And this is what I mean by it's a very deliberate by the system. Mm -hmm. So how did the pharmaceutical cartel present drugs as the one and only solution for all illnesses? Well, you just have to look at how things are funded. I mean, pharmaceutical companies are big in terms of sponsoring uh, medical schools and residency programs where doctors in this country are basically trained. So I know for me, it was almost an everyday occurrence where we had drug representatives coming in when I was in medical school and residency. And even today in my own uh, clinics, the reps come in all the time uh, to talk about their, their medications. And, and again, medications are a great thing when used correctly, but they're not being used correctly. They're being used as the solution to a problem instead of a temporary Pro, uh, fix for a problem until you find the root cause and fix that. So they're inundated with our medical schools, with our training programs, and also the media. There's there's almost no other country in the world that allows direct to, uh, market uh, to consumer marketing uh, like we do here in this country. So you have television ads for the blue pill and this pill and that pill and and you know Cialis daily, so you'll always be ready and on and on and on. <laughs> You have patients showing up at their doctors requesting these medications because they learned about it either on television, print ads, on the internet, and it's, it's really out of control. Yeah, it's just amazing to me, this pharmaceutical mind control, how deep it runs in the population. You, you take a pill for everything. They don't even think of Googling, for instance, natural remedies, things that I can do in my diet or lifestyle changes. Why are people so brainwashed to thinking they need to run to the doctor for a pill? Well, it's a, that's a big question, and, it, and it, uh, it's basically the same question for a lot of things that people get duped over. But, but really, there's a still an inherent trust in the medical system and in doctors to, to give you what you need and tell you the truth. And often the doctors are, are doing what they think is right because that's what they were trained. That's all they know also. So when a patient goes to their doctor and say, you know what, I, I'm anxious, I can't sleep at night, I'm having this problem, I'm having that problem, the first thing that goes through most conventional physicians' minds is, well, if you can't sleep, let's try a sleeping pill. Let's give you something like Lunesta or, or Ambien or Sonata. And if you're anxious, here's a little Valium or Xanax. Instead of taking the time and asking questions of why you can't sleep, why are you anxious? But really, the problem is, is you're punished as a doctor for spending time with the patient because you don't get reimbursed extra money whether you spend five minutes or five hours most of the time with patients. So again, they spend less time and write, uh, write a prescription. And again, we have to remember one other thing is that Americans want, are, are, are people that want immediate gratification. They want the problem to be solved now. That's what we're used to. Very, very impatient. So if I can't sleep, just give me a pill so I can sleep tonight. I don't care about, I don't care about the, the consequences. I just want to sleep tonight. And if it works, then for the medical system and for the patient, often problem is solved, even though they may be on that medication, you know, for the next 10, 20 years. And today, just because a doctor prescribes something and it's legal, people think it's safe without doing any research of their own. Yet pharmaceuticals kill more people than any illegal street drugs, right? Well, it dwarfs illegal street drugs. I mean, it's three times as many people are dying from prescription drug use and abuse than cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine combined. And, and we're not just talking about people overdosing and, and recreational use. We're talking when people are prescribed the medications correctly for a, a specific reason and taking it as prescribed and still have morbidity and still have deaths. And this is because there's a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons is polypharmacy. A lot of people are on multiple medications. Again, 50% of the population is on two or more prescription meds. So when you have someone that's got a little bit of Ambien, for, and I'm not trying to implicate any specific drug, but I'm just using an example, can't sleep, you have a little Ambien, and maybe you're on an antidepressant, and then you have a little glass of wine before you go to bed, mm -hmm. it's a perfect storm for people going to sleep and not waking up, as we've seen with many, many celebrities in the past several years. Can you also explain how prescription pills are being resold after being paid for by Medicaid, which is America's social health care program for our foreign listeners that don't know that? 
Well, you know, there is a, a whole other market for these prescription pills, and we do cover some of that in the, in the film American Addict, and, and, and that is where these medications are, are diverted. So prescriptions are legally written uh, and obtained under people's names, often uh, elderly uh, patients, and resold on, on, a, on, on basically an underground or black market on the street. Uh, and, and so it's being paid for by Medicare and then resold again on the streets for profit. So Jeez. it's a double whammy uh, to the system. So, yeah, drug dealers are, are, are trading in, you know, the cocaine and, and methadone, or, or, I'm sorry, methamphetamines, things like that, and, and pushing prescription pills because it's just more profitable. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, the government stands to make heap loads of money from both legal and illegal drugs, right? Have you looked into how the government highly profits from the pharmaceutical industry? Well, you know, getting into some, some really tough waters here, but there's a lot of things that's going on when you look at the relationships between the DEA, uh, the FDA, uh, big pharmaceutical companies, illegal drug trade. There's just a lot of things that are going on that are, that are absolutely inappropriate. Um, let's look at pharmaceuticals or legal drugs. So you have a situation where the FDA that is supposed to be overseeing new drugs coming on the market in terms of safety and efficacy uh, in, in terms of how they will work on people in a safe manner. And yet they're getting somewhere between 30 and 40% of their overall budget from these same pharmaceutical companies in the way of fees or for their application for drugs. And this is the same people they're supposed to be overseeing. It yeah. is ludicrous. Yeah. So often research is suppressed when you see medications that should never be on the market in the first place get on the market. And it isn't until enough people die or have morbidity, but yet in enough time where profits are made and the research and development money is recouped, that the FDA comes riding in on a white horse like the good guys and take the same drug off the market that should have never been on the market in the first place. It's ridiculous. Yeah, even though the evidence is there that a lot of these prescription pills harm, I mean, 100,000 people die every year, well, that we know about anyway, from prescription pills. Why is it that the FDA is never accountable after they've approved these pills? They just, they're off the hook all the time. Well, you're right. There's no one ever goes to jail. I mean, uh, if this kind of thing happened in the private sector, there'd be all kinds of litigation. But again, it just, just shows that the people that are at the higher rungs of these companies and the higher rungs in government, and by the way, they're interchangeable. You'll see people that are in powerful positions in big pharmaceutical companies end up in government and then vice versa and then come back to government or big pharma again. So uh, at the top, that's where the problem is. There's many, many good people working at the FDA and in pharmaceutical companies, but the, the powers that be at the top of the tops of these pyramids are, is where you see corruption and where you see uh, profits taking over and trumping people's health and well-being. Yeah, it also seems that obviously the FDA only hires people who believe in pills, not true natural healing, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. <laughs> well, I, I think yes and no. And again, there are people that work in the FDA that are doing that work hard and do a good job and identify things that are harmful. But again, if it's going to interfere with something that's been a tremendous amount of investment, uh, this information gets suppressed. You have to remember that, that these drug companies will spend tens, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars in research and development and all these different fees just to get a medication to the finish line. So there's a lot at stake if someone finds research that says this drug shouldn't be released. So this is where the politics and big business and some corruption come into play and at the end of the day, the American public is who pays the ultimate price. Yeah, I also noticed the FDA never never approves or looks into herbs or vitamins that are actually healing. And for instance, there's one herb that I love called Kratom, and a lot of people use it for pain, depression, anxiety, mood, actually to get off of hard drugs. And now it's been put on a watch list. And although it's not illegal, people who purchase it from overseas are having it blocked at the border. Yes, but yes, it, but of course, there's a company that's looking into it now because they want to use it for one of their pills. And so they're going to campaign hard to make it illegal now, you know? <laughs> it's very, very true. And again, when you can't patent certain things, 
people shun it and it's looked at as quackery. And when when uh, legitimate uh, physicians try and talk about using uh, different herbs or nutraceuticals, uh, supplements, etc., you're often marginalized and talked about in a negative way when all the while these things are, are very legitimate. There's multiple, I mean, that's part of what I do when I detox people. I try and have them emerge on the other side of detox instead of having a handful of medications. Maybe they're taking a handful of supplements for a while because as you say, there's all kinds of things like 5-HTP and rhodiola that people can use for uh, depression instead of Prozac and and Paxil and some of these medications that actually can cause people to have suicide, you know, when they're supposed to be causing uh, or treating depression. So it's, it's insane. And again, this is just information that is simply suppressed toward, toward, uh, to the average American, just suppressed information. Now, I know your center is much different, but I, I've been out of the country for five years and then returned. And then I saw these pain management centers popping up all over the place in the States, even in strip malls. <laughs> but they're basically drug dealers, right? Well, pain management, unfortunately, in the United States, for the most part, has become medications or pills and procedures such as epidural injections, both of which normally in most circumstances do not solve the problem long term. And there's a lot of reasons why this has happened, but one of the main problems is that pain physicians in this country, this is about the only way they can make make money. I mean, when you're an interventional, especially an interventional pain management doctor and you're doing epidurals or spinal cord stimulators or these pumps and different invasive procedures that pay well, you can get these things authorized by the insurance company and it pays and that's how they pay their bills and pay their staff. You don't get paid for prescribing someone 5-HTP or giving someone kava kava for anxiety or sleep. You just don't get it. So that's the problem. They're in a box. And also, they don't have time to learn these new techniques. So they go to work every day, and they do what they're trained to do. So it's a vicious cycle, and that's really the problem. Often the doctors, I think, are vilified when they're often the pawns in the system. They're just the, the tool that's used to, 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 uh, to go ahead and, and execute the plans of people that are at, a, at another level in this. Are new diagnoses being made just because of the ill effects of pills? So you mean, are there there are problems caused by the side effects? Yeah, and then a doctor might misdiagnose it as something else? Well, that, that happens. I mean, there's human error. I mean, there, that happens all the time where you misdiagnose. And sometimes, you know, people are human. Sometimes that, that happens, and, and it's, no, not, you know, it's not really someone's fault. But what, what, what does happen that's often fault are the side effects and the medical issues that arise out of the treatment of another medical issue. So when someone, for instance, is taking anti-inflammatories day in and day out for joint pain and different problems, they start to develop gastric ulcers and GI problems as side effects. And then those have to be treated. And next thing you know, they're being scoped by a GI doctor and being treated for that. And, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And it never stops. And really, that's what Big Pharma wants. Because again, sick people that don't die but live a long time sick are great for business. And this explains why we have the medications we have and how, how toxic uh, our food system is. It all keeps people sick and keeps them going to the doctor, but not dying, but just sick. So you yeah. keep coming back every month for that, for that prescription. Yeah, I was looking into right now Medicaid disability insurance. You know, they get a lot of pills every year, most of the people on this insurance. And the average cost for someone right now is $15,000 a year. This is insane. <laughs> yeah, it is insane. It really is. The numbers are, are, are staggering. And when you look at the profits the, the, the big pharmaceutical companies are making, well, well, let's put it this way. You have pharmaceutical companies paying fines in excess of billions of dollars. Uh, just recently, uh, there was, I think, the biggest one in history a few, uh, few months ago um, for uh, some of the antipsychotic drugs or schizophrenia drugs that were used off-label. And they pay a $1.2 or $2.1 billion fine. They write a check and, and, and go laugh about it because they made 3 to $5 billion off the drug in one year. Yeah. So the fines aren't big enough. <laughs> so what segment of the population is the fastest growing for drug abuse right now? Well, what, what I've seen in the last several years and what studies have shown is that, unfortunately, you basically have the two ends of the spectrum, and that's 
13 to 17 year olds and actually uh, seniors. Uh, and seniors, you can sort of understand that because they tend to be on more medication, but they're because of Medicare Part D and because they're easily swayed to take medications because of their age. But then the 13 to 17 year olds, for a variety of reasons, mainly because prescription pills are so readily available just in your medicine cabinet. Almost everybody has old medicines that they got from a dental procedure or whatever, and they just put in the medicine cabinet. And then you have adolescents and teenagers getting these medications and experimenting with them and getting hooked. And, and it's really, really a huge problem in this country right now. Yeah. Well, some people say, well, we need more regulation, Greg. We need to monitor doctors electronically to see what pills they're prescribing. But that isn't the issue here. It's about personal accountability, wouldn't you say? Well, I think it's. I think there's some validity to to, to all. I mean, obviously, personal accountability and and educating yourself and your family is is the number one thing because you can't rely on anybody else. But there are definitely physicians that are bad people. I mean, they're criminals. There are definitely physicians, and we've caught many of them uh, in American Addict and in American Act Two that we're filming right now. I can't tell you how many doctors' offices we've we've uh, with we've worked with uh, with. Um, police agency here in Los Angeles that are just crooked doctors that are basically just giving out medications or prescriptions for cash. So I do think from that standpoint, monitoring is a good thing. But unfortunately, when you put that in the hands of politicians and other people that don't always understand the data, it can be abused. And, and, and here's one perfect example. As a pain doctor myself, I'm by definition going to write a lot more narcotic medications than say, a family practitioner. So if you just look at sheer numbers of prescriptions being written, and that's what they're basically doing and profiling people, it's a mistake because I have tons of people sent to me on huge doses of narcotics every single day. And often I write for narcotics because I have to get approval or have to wait until we can get them set up for detox. So sometimes I have to sort of carry the patients on their narcotic medications. And then I have a whole bunch of people uh, that are clinic street for chronic pain that are still on narcotics. So during this transition period, I'm writing tons, there's tons of narcotics under my name. Mm-hmm. So it's unfair to just look at it that way. But I do think there's some validity to, to tracking physicians to some degree. So if someone comes into you to detox from pain meds, what are the steps that you take? Well, the first, the number one thing is you have to determine if the person really wants to get off the medication mm-hmm. <laughs> because there are people that really enjoy it just like they enjoy street drugs. And so you have to, we have a way of screening people to see if they're really at a point where they want to get better. And then the second thing that I think is very important and it's the wave of the future for most people, but we've been doing it for about three or four years and that's DNA testing. You can look at someone's DNA profile and see with complete accuracy what they may or may not respond to. For example, if a person has anxiety and depression along with their addiction to a narcotic or whatever, that patient is treated differently than someone that doesn't have anxiety and depression. And you can look at their DNA and say, well, maybe they don't, maybe they're having depression because their, their uh, serotonin receptors are, are damaged or not functioning. So it doesn't matter how much serotonin or a, a, a drug like Prozac you give a person that has a certain genetic profile, their, their depression is not going to be affected by that. So by using DNA testing, you can really personalize and guide people's treatment. And then the, I think the second biggest thing is balancing brain chemistry. And what I mean by that is, is that if you don't make uh, someone's brain chemistry normal, they will relapse. It's only a matter of time. When people are stressed, they go back to old habits. And just like a person that needs insulin, um, they're going to have problems with their blood sugar if they don't have the right insulin. So it's no different here. We want to keep their brain chemistry, their, their serotonin, their dopamine, GABA, these type of neurotransmitters normal in these people because most of them have abnormalities. That's why they're addicted to a substance in the first place. Don't amino acids also help with brain waves? Well, amino acids are the building blocks of neurotransmitters. So one of the things that we do, we have an IV protocol, and for three days in a row, I'm giving people IV, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, IV amino acids amongst a whole bunch of other things. But amino acids are, are very, very important. So what are some other things that you recommend for pain? Well, chronic pain is is an epidemic worldwide. And it is, in, in most fear studies, people fear chronic pain more than they do death. 
because at least death is final. But you have people out there, and I'm sure people listening right now, that are in debilitating pain, whether they've had multiple back surgeries, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is also, also known as um, complex regional pain syndrome, uh, pelvic pain, cancer pain. And a lot of people feel like they have no choice but to take a lot of narcotic medications along with other medications just to have some quality of life. And the truth of the matter is that's just simply not true. I use narcotics and I use medications like Lyrica and Neurontin myself, but always while we're figuring out the root causes and trying to do other things to treat the pain to minimize the medications. Because over time, people get tolerant to medications and they don't work anymore. And they also change people's physiology to make them actually more susceptible to pain. I mean, there's something called narcotic-induced pain. So paradoxically, the narcotics over time cause more pain. Yeah, it's like a withdrawal symptom, basically. Well, it's a little, little bit different than withdrawal. It, it's actually changing the, the, the... Our nervous systems are plastic. It's actually changing the characteristics in the nervous system in such a way that we become more susceptible to pain from taking the narcotics. It's, a, it's probably too much to explain on the, on the show, <laughs> but, but, but that's what it is. And it's, it's, very, very, it's a very difficult thing to, to treat in a lot of people. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed this, but it seems our, our population, as we know, is highly medicated. But it seems sketchy driving because people are gone at the wheel, completely gone these days. Have you noticed that? <laughs> You know, it, it's so funny you say that. I was talking to someone this morning on the phone about that. Um, I was on the phone with them while they were driving, and they were complaining about someone cut them off. And, and I said, you know what? Look around you. I said, seven out of ten people yeah. driving around you are on a prescription med, let alone if they're, you know, doing some other drug or doing or drinking or whatever or just have a mental issue. It's it's surprising there's not more more car accidents. <laughs> And people also, you, you shut off your spiritual self when you take these pills. You become flat and uninspired. So then I would think that those people would turn to other drugs and alcohol to fill the void, right? Well, I think that's great that you bring that up. I cannot overemphasize the, the mind-body link, uh, the spirituality. I mean, that, that stuff is, is true. It works. And, and that's one of the things that we, we teach people, too, is, is meditation techniques, uh, medical hypnotherapy, self-hypnosis. And when you're blunted by medications, you cannot participate adequately or normally in, in, in things like this where you can sort of relax your mind because your mind's not working right because it's under the influence of chemicals that you put in your body from the form of a pill. Yeah. Well, if we get into a slightly conspiratorial side, if the population is medicated, they're more easily controlled and mind controllable, right? I'm thinking of the movie THX 1138, if you've seen that. Uh, I, I, yes, I know what you're referring to, and I, and I agree with you. I mean, I think, and again, it it's, gets into conspiracy, and then this is where people start to, to say that, oh, you're, you're paranoid and all yeah. that, but, but it's not true. I mean, when you look at, uh, in a book that I'm, I'm finishing my book, American Addict, right now, it should be out in about 60 days, but in that book, I really emphasize things like the, the, the mass shootings that we see and that how people can be easily controlled because they're distracted. They're distracted by their cell phones, always tweeting, emailing, Facebooking, etc. They're on medications. So there's like this numbing and dumbing down so people can, again, you can do almost anything to them. And like zombies, they just don't pay attention. Even in our school systems, I mean, we, we have people spending more and more, or kids spending more and more time in school and learning less and less and less. Mm -hmm. And what they do learn is really to be better followers and to follow directions, not to learn how to think. Because I think the powers that be don't want people to think because that's the most dangerous thing to upset the system is when people start to think and ask questions. That's right. Well, that's why I get worried when I hear about social medicine coming into America because eventually they can make certain pills and shots mandatory. Do you foresee something like that ever happening in America's future? Well, I've spoken out against Obamacare since day one. And one of the things that, that I, one of the examples I've used is that when you have a situation where there's mandatory clauses in, 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 in these laws that people have to abide, and when you start looking at the Patriot Act and other things, when, pe when there's national security at risk, all you have to do is be named in that. So I'll, uh, a perfect example is if, if, if we have a situation where the government comes on television and says, look, we've been attacked biologically from another country and millions are already infected and millions could die. Um, but don't worry, 
because we have a vaccine. And all you have to do is go to your your local FEMA uh, location to get your injection. And again, the people that are more aware of the conspiracy community would be like, I'm not getting that injection because what do you know they're injecting in me? Mm-hmm. They could be injecting a chip or whatever. But but here's the problem. You, the problem is, is that they could say, look, we can't force you to get it, but if you don't get it, you're a danger to the rest of society, so we have to quarantine you. I mean, this is a, a real possibility. Then you have a situation where neighbors are turning in other neighbors because mm-hmm. of the fear that they think that you haven't had your injection. And, and then you could be detained for not getting the injection. That's the scary part. Yeah, I've, I've seen some women become very defensive when I tell them, you know, you should think twice about vaccinating your children. You know, I've been attacked for that before. <laughs> it's like <laughs> people don't want to hear it, unfortunately, for some reason. Well, they've been, they've been inundated by, again, what we've been taught in the, in the mainstream media, conventional medicine. And again, people are doing what they think is right. But I think the good thing is when you have alternative media, um, just like your show and other shows like this, where people can hear the other side of this, then you start to ask questions. And when you start to ask questions and educate yourself, you can make better decisions. Uh, you can make a, a, gr- a great decision whether your child should have a vaccine or not, and not just like a, a clone or a zombie, just go down and, and get something done. I mean, one, one of the things that I'm totally against are these mandatory testing at a certain age. You turn 40, you should have this done every year. You turn 45, you should have this done. Uh, to me, I think it's just a big scam. Um, mm-hmm. and this, it just ensures that these tests will be done. I mean, to me, why would you go have your colon and everything sco- scoped out every year <laughs> If you have absolutely no symptoms, yeah. just to have a clear, just to be told you have nothing wrong with you, but that test and everything is still built. <sighs> I know we're picking on America, but this really goes for all countries of the world because I know Europe's also highly medicated, and so are other countries, right? Well, we're picking on America for a good reason because America is the number one. I mean, I I did a interview on on Sky News about I think was it was early or about three or four weeks ago in like mid December and. Uh, the, the reason is they had a big article come out that day in Britain about how many uh, uh, people in, in Britain were now addicted to prescription medication. And it was a tiny number compared to us. Wow. But the fact that it's a growing epidemic there is, is concern. And the, and the whole reason they wanted me on is they, they want to know how can we prevent what's happened in the U.S. from happening over there. And it's pretty much the same answer. And that's educate, ask questions, and, and actually find people that will treat you or give you alternatives to, to just pills. But we are so far worse off than other countries when it comes to this. Again, that stat at the beginning of the film, 5% of the world's population using 50% of the world's pharmaceuticals, 80% of the world's prescription hydrocodone, which is in pills like Vicodin and Norco, it's just, it's just completely ridiculous. I wonder why us? Is this a, a fertile testing ground or <laughs> what is it, you know? You know, why are we so lucky? <laughs> well, we're so lucky because we are in a capitalist society. I mean, capitalism is, is making money and, and I'd say, that's I'd say crony, crony capitalism yeah. at that. Well, true, true. But, but again, it's, it's based on a money-making system. And if, we're, if you're selling widgets, then nobody cares. But when you start getting into healthcare, you, you believe or you hope that the corporations will, will be benevolent. In other words, they won't always look at profit only when you're talking about someone's health. But what we have found is whether you're selling coffee beans or prescriptions, that when you get to a certain level, again, money trumps the well-being of the public in terms of health and well-being. And that's the problem. You have big business turn loose and seeing this completely from a business standpoint instead of a human standpoint and that's why it runs so rampant in this country, because that's what we are. We're in a capitalist uh, society. And for me, I, I never like just pointing the fingers on the companies. It drives me nuts because we should be pointing the fingers at ourselves. You know, you have to be big boys and girls and make decisions for yourself. You can't just run and go support these evil companies without doing any research and learning what you're putting in your body. You know what I mean? I, I agree with you. But, but again, unfortunately, most people just don't have access often to information or they don't have time. You know, you have people that are, that are working two and three jobs just to keep food on the table, just to keep their lights on. They're tired. They don't, and this again, I think this is by design. They don't have time to really educate themselves. And then when the time that they do have, it's spent in distractions, like going to see the big blockbuster movies. 
because they're just basically distractions and ways to get away, as are recreational drugs. So when people do have a small amount of free time, they're not sitting there reading a book. They're not going to alternative media. They're watching TV, sitcoms, and going to movies and doing things that are that, that they're really low information and low quality information that they're putting in their brain. And that's why it, you, you see the things that you see. Yeah. They just yeah. aren't getting quality information. I have a feeling, though, if things were privatized and we were in a free market system, I'd say 80% of these drugs would probably never be out on the market because they would, they would find out, oh, these are toxic. They potentially kill people, so we can't tarnish our name. Reject it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that if the system was different, it would, be, it would correct itself. And, and again, and again, we're, we're talking uh, about a lot of gloom and doom here, but I think on the good side of this, that people are waking up. Uh, I think when you just look at the sheer numbers of listenerships of some of the alternative media versus mainstream media, there's a, there's a shift. People are really thirsty for the truth. And when people hear the truth, it really excites them. I mean, I've seen that just from the response, uh, and the film has only been out a few weeks from, from the film. I mean, just the, the stories that, that people are, that are emailing and tweeting and, and, and you know, Facebook notifying me are, are heart-wrenching. And they're just like, it's just like they can't believe that someone has finally put this on film and, and shine the light on it. And it's a, great, it's a great feeling for me, and this is more of what we want to do, because that will help people make informed choices, and that will turn the system around. Well, and thank God for Netflix, so it could reach, what, 40 million subscribers? Because I, I bet if you tried to release this into the uh, distribution chain in the movie theaters, you'd probably be blocked, you know? <laughs> well, I can tell you one thing. I, there was a, a very big program on, on mainstream media that had booked me. It was a TV show. And uh, the day before I was supposed to go on, I mean, it's a big show. If I said the show, everybody would know. And Pfizer was one of their biggest uh, sponsors, and they wouldn't let me come on. They said we couldn't do it. And they <laughs> told me off the record. They told me off the record it was because of that. And, and again, I, I, don't, I don't go around. I mean, sometimes it sounds like I'm bashing Big Pharma, but the movie is really sharing the blame because we're all to blame in here because the, the, yeah. you know, the people are putting these pills in their mouth. So it's the people, it's the doctors, it's the media, it's big business, it's the FDA, it's everybody. But again, it's easy, it's easy to blame the big pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, sure. Yeah, got it. So let's talk about disposing pills. What's the proper way to do that? Because I know our water is contaminated with all these medications. Well, yeah, dumping them in the toilet is not the way to go. There are more and more uh, in, in, in people's neighborhoods are propping up uh, these drop, uh, drop boxes. And a lot of police stations and fire stations now have pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical drop boxes. So it's really easy. People can just Google uh, prescription pill drop off and put their zip code in and they'll find almost anywhere unless you're really living in some uh, way out farming community. It would probably be tough. If you're living in any urban area, it's pretty easy at this point. Some doctors will take them back if they are set up for that. You have to you know, have certain uh, you have to be set up for that. You just can't take it back to all the doctors. You shouldn't take it back to like the pharmacies and things like that. But really, if they Google uh, drop boxes, most people can find some very close to where they live. Now, let's get your opinion on what medications are okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of medications are really good. I mean, even uh, let's take a drug like OxyContin, which has been completely vilified in the press. Um, and, and even in mainstream, everyone's vilified OxyContin mm -hmm. because it's been so abused. But OxyContin is a very good pain reliever. It, it works. There's no doubt about sure. it. Yeah. And if it's used for pain in, in the right setting and then stopped, it is actually a very good drug. The problem is, is that it was so easily abused, especially the old preparation. They've, they've repackaged it now, so it's a lot harder di to divert than it used to be. But oxycodone, the short acting, is still the same. Um, but so, but when it's used correctly, it's fine. So this brings up a very good point is that there's a demand. See, everyone starts talking about, like when you talk about the war on drugs, let's stop it from coming over the borders. Let's regulate, let's do this. None of that has worked and none of it will ever work because there's a demand. So you have to get to wiser demand. People are unhappy. They're frustrated. They want to escape. So the quickest way to do that is by getting high. And when you look at crimes, most crimes are caused because the person was high or they did the crime to get money to get high. Yeah. So 
you have to go to the root cause. And the root cause is that why are people taking drugs in the first place? And when you educate people, give them other ways to feel great and feel naturally high, you slow the demand and then these problems start to go away. But until demand is taken away, it's never going to end. That's right. Good point. So when talking about herbal remedies, what are some happy uppity herbs that you recommend to some of your patients? Well, <laughs> And there's a, there's a lot of things that can help people. And, and normally I, I prescribe these things based on a symptom. So um, a lot of people have anxiety in our society uh, for so many reasons. And I like kava kava for anxiety. I like kava kava for neuropathic pain. I think it can work as good as Lyrica Neurontin for neuropathic pain. That's pain that's electrical, shooting, burning, numbness, tingling, those type of things. There are, uh, I like 5-HTP just for mood elevation. Uh, it makes people feel better. So uh, I like rhodiola for people that have some, that want some mood ele elevation, that have a tendency to eat when they are depressed because there's a lot of weight gain because people eating comfort foods. I mean, the, the, the list really goes on and on. It really depends on what the, the patient's problem is. But I can tell you this much that there's almost always an alternative to medication. Yeah. Medications in our system is great for acute problems. You broke your leg, you have a heart attack, greatest place in the world for medicine. But when you have preventative medicine or to treat chronic problems, we're horrible at it. That's right. You know, I was in Fiji and I tried some kava with the locals. It's strong stuff. These herbs are still very potent, you know? <laughs> Oh yeah, no joke. They could, they wouldn't, abuse. they would drink so much where they couldn't even get up and walk. <laughs> so, well, yeah, there, there's kava is abused in many parts of the world. is is a recreational drug, so yeah, there. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's not strong. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta ask you this. I gotta ask your experience with pharmaceutical reps because I hear that they're recruiting sales reps from cheerleading squads. Is this really happening? <laughs> Well, we put that in the movie, and and it's and it's a little, you know, it's a little tongue in cheek. But but here's the bottom line, and it's just it's in any business, nice looking women get in the door more than men. And this has been ever since I've been in residency, and I mean I've been practice for but 20, 19, 20 years, and I mean it's always been that way. There, most of the reps that I come in contact with are usually female, and usually very good look or better than average looking. And often their bosses are male, but the people out in the field, and that's because women get in the door. And it's it's just it's not a it's just it's just one of those things that it that that, that happens. And uh, uh, again, I don't think that both these the pharmaceutical companies will solely hire people based on looks. But as in any sales job, if all things are equal, attractive people are going to get the nod over someone that's not as attractive because they know that person has a better chance of getting in front of the doctor. Yeah. So what do you say to someone who is listening to the show and says, I need help getting off of pills? What would you tell them? Well, um, I would tell them they've got to really work hard to get the right help because most addiction treatment centers in this country are, are, are horrible. And, and what I mean by that is their success rates are bad. When you look at strictly places that do talk therapy, such as 12-step, um, and I always have to tread lightly because 12-step has such a long history and it's helped a lot of people. But their own data show about a 90% failure rate. Now, again, if you had cancer or if you had some horrible disease, you wouldn't want your doctor to tell you, y'all will treat you, but there's a 90% chance it's going to come back. You want to be cured. So when you look at talk therapy, it just doesn't work for most people. When you look at other traditional inpatient programs where you're basically put in forcibly or, or, or court-ordered or whatever – there is often people treated with methadone, uh, sometimes suboxone, but there's not support for the other problems, the brain chemistry problems, the DNA differences between people, or the differences of abuse. A methamphetamine addict is very different than an alcoholic, very different than someone that had a chronic pain problem that got addicted to OxyContin. So what you want to look for are programs that use that have multidisciplinary, I mean, they have multiple different providers, maybe a psychologist, hypnotherapist, Reiki healer. We have all that kind of stuff, acupuncturist, pain physician, not just a place that's just going to treat you one way. And I think you really want to look for people that know how to do DNA testing for this and then focus on brain chemistry. Now, the problem is there's only a handful of places that I know of in the United States that do, any of them, that do all this stuff in one place. So um, 
you have to do your homework and look hard. But here's the one key thing I would tell people. No matter who you talk to, whether it's a single doctor practitioner or some beautiful facility out in the, the hills or in Malibu or wherever, ask them what their success rate is three, five years out. That's what you want to find out. And if they can't give you those, that, those numbers or they don't want to give you those numbers, that should tell you something. Wow. Well, thanks, Greg. I appreciate your time today. No problem. Can you please tell everyone about your website and how they can reach you? Well, AmericanAddictTheMovie.com, that's AmericanAddictTheMovie.com, is a great place to go to look, to see the movie, to find out where you can see it, buy it, rent it, et cetera. And if they, my, my YouTube channel is connected to that site. Uh, my Facebook is connected to that site. So if they click the buttons on that site, they can get to my own personal sites. And then my medical site is PainReliefGroup.com. Uh, for medical treatment. That's painreliefgroup.com. And I'm getting a lot of emails these days, but I try and I really answer everybody the best that I can because there's a lot of people hurting. And my goal is to help as many people as possible. You also have another film you're working on, Cancer in Wonderland, correct? Well, we have American Addict 2 that we're doing now, which will be out, should be done in July or August. And then we, we, we have uh, uh, Cancer in Wonderland that is slated to begin production right after, about a month after that. And uh, again, very eye-opening, very eye-opening stuff with Cancer in Wonderland. All righty. Thank you. And to everyone listening, if you have Netflix, be sure to watch American Attic tonight. And if your friends and families are hooked on pills for whatever ailment or pain, encourage them to call Greg and sort it out naturally. Thanks again, Gregory. And wait, don't click away just yet, everyone. John has another important aspect to add to this conversation. Welcome back, John. It's always a pleasure. Great to be here. Thanks so much. Well, we just spoke with Gregory Smith about his film, American Addict, and you also made an appearance in the film and were an associate producer. But this conversation about pharmaceuticals wouldn't be complete unless we brought attention to the Rockefeller Foundation. So tell us how the Rockefeller Foundation began forming the medical and drug cartel. Well, it goes back to the turn of the 20th century and a man named Abraham Flexner, who was not a doctor, had never been inside a medical school. But he had written a book about American colleges, and uh, he had gained some recognition for this. And uh, soon enough, he went to work for the Carnegie Foundation. So you, you have to understand that Carnegie and Rockefeller Foundations were working very close together. Abraham Flexner also had a brother named Simon, who was working for the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. And so he was well-connected, Abraham was. And in 1910, the Carnegie Foundation commissioned him to write a report on the state of medical education in America, really. And he did. And this was published as a book, The Flexner Report, very famous in medical circles. And... So on behalf, really, of Rockefeller and Carnegie, this book was highly critical of naturopathy, homeopathy, and other what we would now call alternative forms of treatment, uh, which at the time were traditional. The report was accurate in that it criticized a great many medical schools for just slipshod teaching, the teachers weren't qualified, it was all sort of uh, nonsensical, students were being granted medical degrees based really on nothing. And so Flexner clamped down on that and said that the whole enterprise of American medical schools should be scientific, period. And as a result of his famous 1910 report, about half, maybe more, of all the medical schools in the country were closed down. This was with the aid of the American Medical Association, and of course the government played a role in it as well. So already there was this collaboration forming up a very, uh, very much a heavy hitter collaboration between government, the American Medical Association, Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations. And so the new medical education that emerged in America was labeled scientific to a T, and it was pharmacological. It was all about 
treatment of diseases with pharmaceuticals. And that really gave birth to modern pharmaceutical medicine, which is rampant all over the world now, of course, and has continued to be an operation that is wholly supported and licensed by the federal government, state governments. You have the American Medical Association uh, taking a role in this as well. And of course, what was behind this from a corporate point of view was that Rockefeller in particular, the Rockefeller plan, was going to profit hugely by this tremendous shift into pharmaceutical medicine because they were heavily invested and uh, owned pharmaceutical companies. So it was all of a piece. Basically, the uh, flexion report, although it called for science, was not really about science. And as we can see in the ensuing decades, medical education has not been scientific at all. It's been indoctrination, indoctrination into using drugs for everything, diagnosing conditions, mental and physical, all over the place, regardless of whether they actually exist or not as actual real conditions, and drugs, 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 all of which are toxic. So in a nutshell, that's how the history played out, and that's how Rockefeller Medicine became the premier uh, form of medical practice and education in the country. What Flexner really did was revolutionize teaching medicine in America at medical schools and colleges. And teachers who were on board with Rockefeller, Carnegie, and their programs and you know would bow and bend the knee in praise of those men were afforded good teaching positions and those that refused or defected or criticized Rockefeller and Carnegie were promptly fired in as from teaching positions in medical schools and so this was how the medical system was taken over and as I mentioned many times in articles and uh, also uh, in interviews with you, there is a famous 2000 study done, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association by Dr. Barbara Starfield, who at the time was a revered public health expert at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. She blew the whistle on the fact that by a very conservative estimate, the medical system in America kills 225,000 people a year, of which 119, 106,000 of those by direct effects of FDA approved toxic medical drugs. So you can see just from that the tremendous, horrendous effects of what came to be pharmaceutical medicine in America. Well, and the population just, they believe whatever their, their doctor tells them. The authorities know, so I will take the pill. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's part of the whole deal, too, is to promote through media, through politicians, through law enforcement, the whole idea that this is good for everybody. It's great science. Uh, it's uh, healing. And anything outside that box is highly suspect, if not complete, charlatanism. So that's how people are brainwashed into believing that uh, medical practice is really scientific from stem to stern. Now, why is it that the FDA is never accountable for approving pills that are known to be dangerous? That's a very good question. It's a protected agency of the federal government that has major corporate ties to pharmaceutical companies. In fact, now, really, pharmaceutical companies are clients of the FDA. And a, an FDA uh, analyzer of new drug applications by the name of Kavanaugh was interviewed maybe a year and a half, two years ago. 
and just outright said that he was told when he worked for the FDA that the drug companies are our clients. Understand that. They pay the FDA to have the FDA inspect their new drug applications and to look at the studies that they, the clinical trials they perform. And so the gist of the message was we approve the drugs. Not all the drugs all the time, but many, many, many toxic drugs are approved by the FDA. So this corporate connection with uh, Big Pharma means that the FDA is really off limits for any kind of serious prosecution by the Department of Justice. And of course, within the federal government, one agency, uh, even though there may be internal competition, will wash the hands of the other agency to protect it because if one domino were to fall, like the FDA, others would fall afterwards. Mm -hmm. There would be a wide-ranging scandal and uh, people would begin asking, well, what about the CIA? What about the FBI? What about the Department of Homeland Security, et cetera, et cetera? So the FDA is powerfully protected. They don't feel the slightest bit of a threat until the internet, I would say. And that's when the worm began to turn because lots of people have been exposing the FDA as basically a criminal agency. And meanwhile, the government is financially really profiting from pharmaceutical companies as well, right? Oh, yeah. You've got politicians, of course, who get contributions from pharmaceutical companies. And I'm, I would say in my opinion, that some of these politicians are given money under the table as well as campaign contributions. And then, of course, the FDA itself is partially funded by the drug companies. And then you've got FDA uh, scientists and executives who pass through the revolving door into big pharma companies and back again. So lots of money is moving around, lots of protection is being offered. And so you really have a criminal agency on the loose. I mean, just, uh, it's like the mob. You know, this is a RICO operation, continuing organized crime to approve toxic drugs that are killing people. And in case listeners haven't done the simple arithmetic, the Starfield report, in the year 2000 that indicated 106,000 people a year in America were killed directly by FDA approved uh, pharmaceutical drugs. If you add all that up over say a decade, you're now talking about more than a million deaths. So this makes the Mexican drug cartels, uh, the mafia, any kind of organized crime activity in America pale by comparison to the FDA. Now, how do you think the elite profit from a highly medicated population? Yeah, that's very important. Um, pharmaceutical drugs are designed to kill. They kill microorganisms because they are poisons, basically. And this covers the waterfront of pharmaceutical drugs. So over time, the toxic effects on humans as they take drugs from cradle to grave builds up and up and up and people become debilitated. They become confused and um, sometimes really crazy from pharmaceutical drug, from uh, psychiatric drugs. And so what you've got is an operation really to eat out the country from the inside because so many people are on drugs. I mean, so many prescriptions are written in America every year that you've got uh, a population that can't think straight most of the time. They're just trying to get by. And this is good for big government. It's good for the big alliance between corporations and big government. It's good for media because dumbed down, confused, debilitated people will accept the news at face value. 
it works for what is essentially uh, more and more turning into a slave state where people just simply don't have the capacity or the energy as well because these drugs uh, tend to debilitate energy significantly over time. The population just doesn't have the energy to really see what's going on and uh, do something about it. Yeah, it's also important to say that the Rockefeller Foundation funded various eugenics research, right? So it's highly possible that all these pills are also about weeding out the population, the undesirables, if you will. Yes, and I think that uh, a real investigation into sterility would be called for here because population figures, although the population of the United States is increasing, you can go into various places and various groups and see that the birth rate is declining. And various explanations are given for that, all of which are misleading. So the toxifying of the human body in general, I believe would be a very good place to start to really explain the declining birth rate in certain sectors of the society. And over time, of course, this decline will be even more visible and serious than it is now. Also, it's very easy to slip items into vaccines, which would create even more widespread sterility among all population groups. And I think that this is a strategy. It's not, unless uh, something changes, it's not one of these operations that says, okay, what we're going to do here is overnight reduce the population of the planet by X billion number of people. Yeah. It's a gradual decline over a long period of time. And this is a perfect way to, to do that kind of Rockefeller operation. It sure fits with Margaret Sanger's idea of sterilizing the population. Yes, absolutely. And deciding that certain groups don't uh, deserve to reproduce. That was her whole point. And so various groups within society can look forward uh, to that happening because even though political correctness dictates all sorts of tolerant speech for everybody under the sun, the elites do not, absolutely do not share that. No. So they would be targeting all sorts of groups they would consider undesirable and uh, working to essentially wipe them out. Sure, I understand we need pain pills, anesthesia, antibiotics, but it, today it just is out of control, and I suspect that the vast majority of these medications actually don't really do any good. What, what do you think? Yes, absolutely. You could get by on a very small number of uh, medical drugs, and only in limited situations. You don't need this incredible proliferation of medical drugs for the population. Absolutely not. But the system that's been created, the Rockefeller-Carnegie system, means that drug companies and researchers are always going to be on the lookout for defining and inventing new medical conditions that need drugging. And it makes, it really makes absolutely no difference whether these are real or fantasy. In fact, in some ways, it's better if they're just fantasies. It's simpler to do it. So that's been the case for a long time, and it continues to be the case. And so the drugs, the number of drugs proliferate, which is exactly in line with pharmaceutical profits. That's what they want to do. They want to be able to search out new markets all the time and say, you know, there's people who have, uh, what would you call it, let's see, their legs are uncomfortable. Mm, restless leg syndrome, <laughs> right? And we can name that, we can sort of describe it, we can throw out a lot of money to do research on it, uh, we can teach about it in medical schools, and of course we can develop drugs to treat it. It's, you know, they just make it up if they need to and if they want to and they do want to. So, yes, this is a um,
completely false proliferation of the numbers of drugs. Not necessary at all. Yeah, I thought it was a joke when I saw that restless leg syndrome commercial for the first time. I was like, yeah, I thought it was too. I, I, I knew right away this is BS, and anyone that believes it is a total moron. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and there are lots of morons. Well, this mind control over the medical and scientific community that thinks pills are the only answer ever be broken? I, I see good signs. I see signs that people are waking up. And this includes doctors who eventually begin to feel very guilty because they, they realize that most of what they're doing is completely uh, inessential and also highly toxic. It includes teachers, it includes uh, you know, people in the public who have been victimized or they know somebody who's been victimized. All sorts of people are waking up. Even journalists uh, are realizing that they can print some stories about these subjects. And so I see very positive signs, very positive signs on the horizon. The bottom line is, against any and all odds, we have to protect people's freedom to decide whether or not to take a drug, a medical drug. Because if that freedom is protected, then people can have the time and space to learn enough about what's really going on so that they will begin to say to their doctors, no thanks. And this revolution has been ongoing for a long time now, but with the internet, it's spreading much more rapidly that people are waking up. And as long as we've got that bottom line freedom, then we have the time and the space to really win the revolution. Thank you, John, for sharing this information. It's been very helpful. Great. I'm really glad we had a chance to do this, and thanks a lot. I always enjoy these conversations. Okay, everyone, you can hear more of John and the film American Addict on Netflix. Be sure to check it out. A few others you'll recognize make an appearance as well. And, of course, John's website is nomorefakenews.com. Have a pleasant evening, John. You too. Thanks. Well, it's amazing how naturopaths were silenced and made out to be quacks in the early 1900s. And sure enough, as the years went by and the money funded a new type of medical school and research, naturopaths went out of vogue and the people fell for the lie. Again, this is not just about the money. If you research the people involved in setting up the medical and drug cartel, they were all eugenicists and still are today. But I notice a big comeback of naturopaths all across America, more than in other countries, which makes me hopeful. So on that note, stay medication-free, GMO-free, chemical-free, and have a pleasant evening.